You're listening to The Raw Reaction on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. It's me, Big Dick, here, and we got, in place of Angry Tensai, who is a little too on vacation at the moment, we have, I believe it is the Angry Sudoku. Sure, I'll be Angry Sudoku. I'll, t- I'll take Angry Tensai's place, and I, I, I won't be the great Sudoku for this show. I'll be Angry Sudoku. Okay, he, he, he's, feeling, he's feeling angry. And you know what? I, I, I'm a little angry too. I've, um, we were discussing before the show and I, I may mention, I, I've, lo- I've loved Raw since WrestleMania. I've been a big fan of where they're going with matches and storylines. I've loved it. And then tonight it was sort of, it was sort of down the rabbit hole. Um, it was, uh, so sort of, it, it was a mailed in show and there were some, there were some good matches, but, you, you knew it was going to happen every match. No, no big upsets, no big suspense, not no real build towards the pay per view. So, um, unfortunately, I think this raw lowered my lowered my expectations again as far as what to expect from WWE. What were your thoughts on uh on this raw? Yeah, I think just straight away, right off the bat, I got a good feeling when Shane O'Mac came out. It's really great to see a babyface commissioner or authority type role. But then instantly the tone for the show was set when Stephanie came out. And my first thought was, I really wish Anderson and Gallows would come out here and just beat the hell out of Stephanie because she's kind of like Roman Reigns. I don't want to see her on my TV. She's just grating and abrasive and annoying. And the less of Stephanie on my TV, the better. You know what? I agree with most of the, those terms, except for the fact that, and I think Killer Kev is in agreement on that. For two kids out of the oven, she Stephanie McMahon is sexy thick. She is sexy thick. Would you tend to agree with that? Eh, she's she's okay for yeah, like you said, for squeezing out two kids, she doesn't look too bad. Hey, she's no Oscar, but then again, who is? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And hey, you know what? She has a couple million dollars in, in the in the coffers, that, that's not a, that's not exactly a turn off for me either. So that good, rich good milk her. demographic is is filled in right there by Stephanie. Yeah, and you know what? If, if Triple H were to um, to decide to divorce her, I would be happy to be her rebound fuck at some point. I would uh, I'd make her. She she would regret it immediately after, but I would be in there to to fill that gap, that very uh, that very expansive gap where. The Macho Man and, and Triple H have, uh, have both explored in the past. So, so if Hunter were to leave yeah, her, you would slide right in in more ways than one. Yeah, exactly. It would be, it would most likely be like a hot dog down a hallway, but it would probably be more like Ooh. a tic-tac down a hallway. Like, but, like uh, firing a anyway, shooter in a traffic tunnel. Exactly, exactly. But, uh, anyway, this was a interesting start. Um, you have Shane Man come out to try to do his, GM, I'm running the show thing. Stephanie came out to sort of, this is, I think this is the first time we've seen her since, uh, since WrestleMania and after taking a big hard spear by Roman Reigns. Um, Indeed. so anyway, she came out and basically said, Hey, you know what? We're taking over Raw again. It's like you had, it's like you lost your match to the Undertaker. Um, you had your fun and now Vince is going to give us control again. So. Apparently, this is going to be announced at the payback pay-per-view, which may or may not be the most important um, happening of the evening. But, um, yeah, so it's either Stephanie McMahon or Shane McMahon. No match, no stipulations, just basically saying, hey, one of my two children is going to run WWE for a while. And personally, for me, from what I've seen over the last month, this past week, sort of withstanding... I, I'd hope that Shane gets the uh, Shane gets the nod. I think that he's uh, he's improved it. 
and a lot of it has been helped by an influx from NXT, bringing a lot of uh, the younger talent up and sort of freshening up the roster a little bit. But uh, yeah, I think that uh, or at least I'm hopeful that he gets to continue as WWE Raw GM for the foreseeable future. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I would like to see that too because yes, yeah, as, as you said, a lot of NXT talent has been brought up. That'll come into play later in the uh, evening on Raw. I have this sneaking suspicion, though, that they may still do a brand split, and the big announcement by Mr. McMahon may say, okay, well, Shane's going to run Raw, but the authority is going to run SmackDown. Yeah, you know, you know, and that wouldn't that would be terrible if they said the authority is going to run SmackDown, and then SmackDown would sort of be the feeder from NXT, where Triple H it sort of runs the show and is the god of NXT, at least in his own mind and a little bit more on the, on the shows there. He's sort of the godfather there. So yeah, I think that that's uh, I think that's a possibility too. It'll be interesting to see. I mean, uh, either or I just, I think that they need a split. I think that now is a hard time for right after WrestleMania is a hard time for a split. Um, however, like I had mentioned earlier, we have had a big influx of talent from NXT recently. So I think that, they could be bulking up the roster a little bit to support a brand split there. So it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see what they do and how they uh, how they decide to do it. And if they do uh, do it, and they do have Hunter on SmackDown. They really do need to define a consistent role for Hunter between NXT and SmackDown, and not have him be a heel on one show and a face on the other. Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, I think it takes away. I mean, WWE. They, Almost, I mean, they had it to the point where, I mean, he's obviously, he's a face on NXT, and with so many internet fans following WWE in his feud with Reigns, they say, hey, you know what, we like NXT, Triple H is the man there. I mean, Triple H, great shape for however old he is, and for being the COO, or whatever the heck his title is for the company. I mean, mad respect. I mean, he came out, and he... uh he looked the part, put on a hell of a match at WrestleMania. So I think that uh, he definitely earned more than a heel, face, fan, not fan. He definitely earned some respect at uh, WrestleMania performance he put on. Yeah, he put on a decent match. It would just be nice to see him, especially if he's going to take NXT talent, as you had uh, theorized on, say, a SmackDown show, to have him keep that face role and to elevate the talent there to SmackDown and then run it as a bigger Better version of NXT. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what they what they end up doing. My only concern is that there's not necessarily enough talent to support two separate rosters. In my opinion, I mean, maybe if you combine NXT with SmackDown, that could do the trick. But I don't know. Maybe right you say roster, you wanted to bring guys from NXT up to SmackDown, and then say you have your tag team division only on SmackDown. Each division gets a heavyweight singles champion, but tag teams are like only on. SmackDown, something like that might work. I, too. I, don't, I don't know. I think that's the. I think that's the. That's sort of the tricky part as far as how you would split it, just because I mean we've had we have probably three of the hottest newest tag teams right now are all immediately up from NXT. So do we keep them on Raw and have that be the mothership, or do we put them over to SmackDown with all the new NXT talent? So, you can do that. I don't yeah. know. It's, all, uh, all theory and speculation at this point, anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, so we'll see what happens. Anyway, first match of the evening, and this was the start of a um, League of Nations, more, more or less their their massive breakup party. I think that uh, what they kicked out Wade Barrett a couple of weeks ago, and obviously he was the uh, the the guiding light for them. So they've been having some issues ever since, and I think that uh. With uh, Bray Wyatt's recent injury, I think that they their program with the Wyatt family was pretty much scrapped behind closed doors, and um, the League of Nations as a whole. I mean, I think they've been universally disappointing as a team. That could have been maybe not the four horsemen, but they have enough talent between the four of them: former champions, great wrestlers, great workers, and they basically t- tonight was almost the turning them into the, the social media mafia or social media yep. outcast. 
yeah, the, the heavyweight right, version right. of the social outcasts. And yeah, the, the League of Nations is kind of the antithesis of the sum is greater than, or the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, where you've got the League of Nations where individually these guys were, well, maybe not Seamus, but yeah, guys like Rusev at one time were big and bad, Alberto Del Rio, who could be a champion anywhere he goes. But yeah, you put them together in this ragtag group that, that jobs all the time, and it's just not doing anything for any of them. Yeah, so, anyway, this was, like I said, this was the start of a of a little night for the League of Nations, and I think I had seen on the internet somewhere where Joe Rio was actually saying that, yeah, they're going to get broken up. I mean, they just didn't, they just didn't resonate with the fans. They're one few that possibly could have saved them, or at least put them on life support against the Wyatts was scrapped once Bray got injured. But, uh, anyway, the first match is actually a really good match. Um, AJ Styles and Sheamus, um, I think going into this match, everybody felt fairly confident AJ Styles would pull out the win there with um, his big, obviously his big uh, pay-per-view main event at uh, Payback with um, with Roman Reigns. Sure enough, uh, good back and forth match. He definitely took a took a bit of a beating from Sheamus, but I don't think the doubt was. I don't think there was much doubt as far as who was going to win. And I think it was about a 14, 15 minute match. It was a really solid. Displayed by both wrestlers, but uh, Styles predictably picked up the uh, picked up the win there. Yeah, Styles picked up the win. Sheamus no longer has the Doctor Zoidberg beard going on. He just had a normal beard this time. Um, yeah, it was a long match. I wasn't a fan of it. I prefer watching AJ Styles work matches against quicker guys. Like when he was in there with against Jericho, I remember complaining that Jericho seems to have lost a step. It's a different style. It's like if you want to bring up. Like, I, I'll tell you what would be really interesting to see. A guy who could work a very good match with a slower style like Sheamus likes to work is a guy like Shinsuke Nakamura. I mean, they could have a nice slobber knocker, knock down, drag out, just kick each other in the head, punch each other in the face. Great match. But, yeah, I mean, Styles got to get his shit in. He got the the phenomenal forearm. He got to hit some of his spots there. So it was interesting because at one point in the match, he was uh, going to weaken Sheamus' leg, and I thought they were setting up for the calf crusher, but that wasn't what won the match. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, I definitely noticed that too. The one thing, uh, one thing I will say is, and again, this might just be the, the realist in me, but, uh, the phenomenal forearm by AJ Styles, I don't know how that's a finisher. I don't consider that a, an impressive finisher. No, I, especially I when I want to use. I've seen more impressive okay. moves, of course, in New Japan, but I've seen him use more impressive moves in WWE, too, like the springboard 450 splash into the ring. That would be a better finisher. Yeah, you know what? Even, a, even the Pele kick would be a better finisher than that because, I mean, people love it, but the phenomenal forearm, it's just, it's not even, it doesn't even look like you're getting hit that hard. Yeah, it's and, not. I mean, that's something in New Japan that he used as a transition spot, you know, when he was you know, transitioning from being out of the ring, coming back into the ring, and then, you know, going to work the leg for the calf crusher or going to work for some more high-risk maneuvers. But, yeah, I mean, it was always a transition spot, and to see it as a finisher is a little odd. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, not the best not best combination, but you know what? I mean, Seamus, he, he's a solid performer, or he's a solid wrestler. He's a solid, solid talent. So he, he did the job. And after the match, uh, predictably, maybe, maybe not, we had Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows come up and basically give him a big round of applause. Pretty stoked that, uh, that he won and making, uh, making an appearance before their debut, uh, wrestling match at the beginning of the show. And yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting to see the, the tease of is AJ on their side? Are they on AJ's side? And then a big old monkey wrench gets thrown into that, knowing that, uh, Finn Balor just lost the NXT title. Now it's like, hmm, you know, maybe Finn Balor will be coming up at Payback to join Gallows and Anderson. And if he does, are they going to turn on AJ? Are they going to welcome AJ? Are they going to cost AJ the match? Are they going to help AJ win the match? There's just all kind of possibilities that it sets up. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I thought that uh, I had seen some video clip of Finn Balor saying something like, hey, I'll see you guys Monday night. A bunch of fans, but I don't know, maybe he thought he was going to get debut on Monday or maybe he meant Monday after payback. But, yeah, I mean, I think he's, it's about time. I mean, he just he, dropped the title to uh, um, to uh, Samoa, Samoa Joe, Joe. on yeah. a house show. So I think that uh, I, I think that's time to bring him up. I mean, the ro- roster sort of depleted. 
you're bringing the rest of the Bullet Club members up. I mean, I think we need to bring him up now or pretty soon and take advantage of it because, I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, uh, I think the uh, Anderson and Gallows, I mean, they were probably one of the biggest pops at um, at Raw or over Raw the last couple of weeks, but especially their match against the Fusion. I mean, I think people were ready for him and pretty stoked to see him, ready to see uh a bullet, some sort of a Bullet Club reincarnation. Yeah, and they were actually chanting Bullet Club during the match, which is interesting, which kind of goes to prove that the fans at Raw know who they are. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's no doubt that they, they know who they are. I think they put a couple little Bullet Club gang signs up or whatever during the, during the match or after the match and celebrating they had a couple of things. But uh, after anyway, after this little uh, transaction, or after this little happening out on the stage and in the ring, they cut back to Roman Reigns, who's sitting back in his locker room. Crowd immediately beat the hell out of him. And then the Usos, who for many years I've actually I hated the Usos. I just don't like them at all. They haven't really done much for me, and I think they've got way too many undeserving title shots, which they lost all of over the peak or valley of the WWE tag division. But, um, Anyway, he, they joined him in the locker room and basically said, hey, we got your back, we'll, we'll cover you. He's like, eh, I don't necessarily need it, but I got your back too. So this was a, this was an interesting development, sort of a, also a good buildup for uh, for later in the night, which uh, which we saw. So it was interesting to uh, – interesting little topic. I think that we saw where Anderson got as their first target was a use of – we saw that. Um, rivalry, or at least the start of a rivalry developing a couple of weeks ago and um, continuing through um, this past Raw here. So then we had a, actually probably one of my favorite segments of the show. We had the New Day invite both the Von Villains and the uh, um, Enzo and Cops, the cats, out, at, uh, out to the ring, introduced them each, let them Get their, uh, their trademark smack talk in and just say, hey, good look at the pay per view. What did you think about this, uh, promo right here? Just, yeah, for a guy like me who doesn't really like promos, I really like the spot. The, the thing that I liked in particular was, uh, Aiden English, cause they were, they were talking about, I think it was the New Day who was talking about Prince and Prince's passing and being in Minneapolis and getting a good crowd reaction and saying they wanted to party like it's 1999. And Aiden English had a line. He just took it, ran with it. He hit this ball out of the park. This was a Grand Slam home run where he, right in his gimmick, just said, I want to party like it's 1899. And they came out singing. They came out working the vaudeville gimmick. And it was just like, yes, the vaudevillains are definitely at a level where they are ready to be on Monday Night Raw. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, they've been around NXT for uh, they've been NXT. For a while now, I mean, they were champs a while back, and then they sort of they stuck it out after they lost the championship. But yeah, I mean, that was a that was a good match. You mentioned Minnesota. This act, this paper, or this uh, Monday Night Raw was actually in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, it was so, okay. Very close to the hometown of one angry Tensai, who may or may not have been in attendance there, um, chanting for the Bullet Club the entire night, but. Um, Anyway, great promo here. New Day did what they did. I was sort of hoping they would come to all the teams would come to blows, including the New Day, and just have a big fight for a while. But it was sort of a standoff in the ring, and that was that was the end of it. And I'm kind of glad they didn't because there's, there's two things that I'm glad didn't happen. And the first is that the Vavillans and Enzo and Cass didn't touch in the ring because that's. That makes a bigger build for, I guess it's not really a pay-per-view, it's a networking event for payback, but that, that kind of makes the match at payback more special because they haven't touched in the ring. They were just throwing words back and forth, and it's kind of building to a head. The other thing that I like about payback coming up is that the New Day doesn't have a match. They're just going to sit back and see who wins, and I like that too, that you're not – it's like, okay, this is for a number one contender, and in the interim, yeah, it, you should not have another team facing New Day. Just you know, wait and see who wins this one. So I think they're doing all right by that there. Yeah, and you know what? I think that, uh, I mean, just like WrestleMania, they didn't have a title match necessarily, New Day, but they were entertaining as all hell. So, I think I don't think they, they don't necessarily need a match or a title match or anything 
anything from here to be able to steal, participate and or steal the show. So I think they'll have a, they'll be a big part of this pay-per-view, at least, uh, in hyping up this tag team match. And, uh, I don't know who, who are you thinking wins this, wins this match? There's uh, two trains of thought that I have, but, uh, I the, the train of thought that I have is, um, you're, you're going to want a heel face combination for the title match and new day is over huge as faces. You're not going to want to put them against end zone cast. I can see the VOD villains winning at payback so they can take on the New Day while Enzo and Chaos can continue the feud they have been having in the past few weeks with the Dudley boys. Yeah, you know what? I was, I was thinking something very similar with that. With And I was going to say even as far as having the Dudleys come out and interfere and end up costing um, Enzo and Cass the, uh, the, the number one contendership championship. I like that idea. <laughs> if that hasn't been match. booked, that way it involves. Yeah, I mean that that way it'll evolve two tag team pay per views or two tag team matches for that'll eventually lead to probably one on Raw, one on the next pay per view. Oh yeah, because that or, that raises uh, the stakes huge in a tag team feud when another tag team comes and interferes, and that that will just you know add some fuel to the fire for their feud right there. Yeah, and I mean the the Dudleys, they're you know what they're. Uh, if you got to be a better uh, heel team, you need to be careful who you're putting them against. You can't put them against a team like the Usos, who are pretty much right up there with uh, um, right up there with Roman Reigns as far as go away heat. But I mean, you put them up with a new tag team and they mess around and go through the tables. And guess what? They're going to be they're going to get some pretty solid heat against them. And this could help turn them into a pretty solid heel. So. Yeah, so I think I think that there'll be two, few, at least two tagging feuds um, coming out at a pay per view. So, um, and then possibly a third with this um, with this body rivalry between Anderson and Gallows and the Usos, um, which brings us to our next match: the two members of the or former members of the Bullet Club, which will probably be reincarnated as the Bullet Club or Balor Club or whatever they want to do it. And by the way, I'm a big fan of a uh, big fan of their ring attire. I thought their jackets and little ring gear stuff. I thought it was pretty badass. Yeah. Uh, one of my friends on Twitter live tweeted during raw saying, yeah, the doc and Luke there, they look like they've got uh half Cenobite gear on from the Hellraiser movies. I'm like, that's pretty appropriate. Yeah. Well, you know, you know what? One thing I will say is, uh, um, I, I, I did like the, I like the little trench coat look on them with logos and the, the matching, uh, or not, not matching, matching logos, I guess, on their ring attire. But I think that, uh, WWE should have, uh, at least with Gallows, should have just stuck with, uh, stuck with a pair of jeans and a, a t-shirt. Cause he sort of looked, his ring attire made him look a little bit more like Festus where as the past couple of weeks with, and then he was beat down and just changed his t-shirt. He actually looks a lot bigger and a lot, a lot more cut and in shape. So I, think, yeah, I, don't, uh, I like when they have I the mean, matching outfits for a tag team. Yeah, that's something that I like. They both got the bald heads, so they got that going for them. And yeah, I do like the logo. I just, I just wish they'd kind of have a name for them, but that seems to be in the works. And yeah, it'd be interesting to see if they use face paint on gallows like he did when he was in new Japan, but I doubt it. I mean, that, that seems to be the Usos gimmick and it's not helping them get over at all. Yeah. But I mean, if they, if they do it with, uh, with Finn Balor, they do face paint like they do at a big paper used with him. I think that'll be, I mean, it'll, it, it, the biggest thing with Balor is, I mean, people, and don't get it wrong, he's a great wrestler and everything, but I mean, his entrance is, Pretty badass, and I do remember. I recently just started watching the uh, NXT, on the NXT circuit a little bit, and I remember one of my comments a while back was, "Wow, it's like I think that a wrestler sort of like Sting and who are other face paint wears, they really need to get with Balor because I mean, he had, I think one of his the papers was like NXT in London. He literally had like a, a detailed drawing of like Big Ben in London on his back." And I mean, that stayed together through pretty much 20, 25 minute match. I'm like, wow, he did something right with his, uh, 
with his face and body paint there. And he had like a monster on his chest or something that opened up to like a giant mouth with his head and face, which was uh, pretty badass. But I mean, none of the paint came off during the match, which was pretty Which says a lot too. And yeah, when they have a theme for it, like he does with his demons, or like you were saying, Big Ben, it's a lot better and it's a lot more meaningful than just slapping some neon face paint on one half of an Uso's face and saying, look, they got face paint. Yeah, and they like to party in the paint, or they like to don't mess with the the face paint. But yeah, I almost think it's a different kind. Of, it's a different type of face paint because that face paint it never really washes off to any degree or any major degree during uh, during his matches. So well done on the on the paint, Pinbauer. Well done. Hopefully, you bring that artist to WWE. But uh. Anyway, speaking of which, we had a, a little bit earlier, we talked about the Usos, Carl Anderson, and Doc Gallows, a.k.a. Festus, a.k.a. Doc from Aces and Eights, a.k.a. anything else that we forgot, any other names? I think that's it. You got Doc Gallows, you got Luke Gallows, you got Doc, you got Festus. That's about right. And, and I'm... Fortunately, he's part of a cool tag team, or he, I'm sure he would be getting the uh, the um, tense eye treatment of, oh, wow, here's a new wrestler, tense eye, and everybody realizes, hey, guess what? That's not really tense eye that we have in the ring there. It's, I get, we get it's a gimmick, but it's... Uh, Albert. Yeah, it's Prince Albert. Or like when... Um... Have, that, have that tank going on in the middle of the main event on Raw during his debut. Or when they first debuted the character of Bray Wyatt and the fans were chanting Husky Harris. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I think that, that that's a good good way to look at it. I mean, you know what? Smarks are going to do what they want to do. But if you put out a cool character like Bray Wyatt, it's going to get, it's going to get, you pass this chance. Whereas, Tensai, also known as Prince Albert, that was, that's been of a stretch. And he definitely didn't ball in main events, and that little run he had ended pretty quickly. Yeah, he didn't go but, much uh, anyway. With that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was it was, it was, He actually won a couple of matches leading up to the next. Uh, he had a decent match on a pay per view or something, but after that, it was just opening on the pre show. So anyway, next match: Dallas Anderson versus the Usos. Again, this was sort of a cool match. I would have rather have seen this than coming to an end. I would have rather have seen this extend and both teams get DQ'd or something like that and lead into the pay-per-view. I believe these two teams are fighting at the pay-per-view, which could be a really interesting match. So I would have liked to have seen more of a, less of a absolute beat down of the Usos and build up of um, Gallows and Anderson and more of a, disqualification and build something to hype up the next pay-per-view. But, uh, I mean, basically they end up, they end up winning. Um, the Usos got pretty banged up. One of them was sent outside uh, the ringside rail area while they, um, the Polar Club members basically put their finishing move on in the ring. And then after the match, they continued to beat down the ring for a couple of minutes. Until none of or other than everybody's hero, Roman Reigns came and ran out and made the same. So, I don't know. This didn't do much for me. And I don't know. Are these two teams facing off again at the paper if I'm not sure. Let me take or a look and find be, out. Uh, most likely, or will they most likely be getting involved with the, uh, the main event between, um, what's his name? Um, Reigns. AJ Styles and, and Styles. Roman Reigns. Yeah, I don't know. If yeah, be. Let me take a look at the card. But yeah, with this match that we're talking about against the Usos, this was just a, this was the most brutal match of the night. Where that one spot where they shoved one of the Usos from the top turnbuckle all the way to the guardrail, which is why he was there at the guardrail. Yeah, it was brutal, and I liked it because anytime the Usos are getting beat down. It's a good thing in my book. I marked out big time, too, being the New Japan fan that I am, the number of times that JBL actually mentioned the letters IWGP, talking about the tag team titles that uh, Doc Gallows and Carl Anderson had held. It was like, wow, they mentioned the IWGP I, title. I was going to say, I never, uh, I, I, I'm not a big uh, New Japan mark, so I, I definitely didn't catch that. I think I 
I do recall him saying that once or so, but I didn't catch that as the main part of this match. And yeah, no, the Doc uh, Gallows and Carl Anderson are not on the payback card as of yet. Okay. And you know what? The, the sad thing is about that is uh, the pre the pre show, and I don't know even where they announced it. I'm not, I, I think they announced it on on Raw. But it, it basically, this match to do and respect that they be giving this match up and this for a while. There is a, a pre match, a pre show match of Kalisto and Ryback, which, if I recall correctly, is a WrestleMania rematch where both competitors have probably not been on either SmackDown or Raw since WrestleMania. And, they're and they like, yeah, it, it seems they always get stuck on the pre-show on pay-per-views. And not only are they getting stuck in the pre-show, this is a pre-show match for the WWE United States Championship. And it was the same way at WrestleMania. You've got a title on the line and it's on the pre-show. I mean, why can't you put, you know, I don't know, put... Something on something else on the pre-show and let the get the U.S. title match be in the main show itself. Yeah, I mean, you know what? Put the Usos versus uh, Anderson and Gallus. That would be that would be fun to put some. some oh yeah, like look at, like like Dolph Ziggler versus Baron Corbin. Who the fuck wants to watch that? Put that on the pre-show. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that, that's one of the matches I feel like they've sort of rushed a little bit getting into it. They haven't really told a great story about it, other than. Baron Corbin just coming in there and being a pretty big dude and need, sort of needing something to push uh, Ziggler towards moving forward. But yeah, not a big fan of uh, not a big fan of the opening show and then questionable as far as Corbin and um, Ziggler. I think Ziggler will put in the work and really bust his ass to make him look good. But I think this is almost a win to Ziggler at this point. And I hate it because it's sort of starting the burying of um, Baron Corbin already. He's not getting exactly. the Apollo burial at this point, but he's well ahead of the, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, shoot, I'm drawing a, sorry, I got a brain fart there. While well, you're having that brain fart, yeah, it just seems that they brought him up so he could win the Andre the Giant Battle Royal and then lose every match after that. It's just the booking doesn't make a lot of sense with him. It's like, did you were you intending to bring him up and then have him job out? Were you intending to have him up and push him bigger and it didn't work out? It just it doesn't seem like they're uh, using Baron Corbin correctly. Yeah, you know, you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna say there. Is I'm gonna compare his bring up into the main event with two or three with three wrestlers, two of which are the Ascension, which getting brought up was absolutely horrible and probably destroyed him within the first couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. And then the other was former NXT champion Neville, who is, I think right now, he's training for a match versus one of the social media outcasts on WWE Superstars on Saturday morning. Boy. So, yeah, I mean, they, they just... And, and WWE, I mean, they're, they're going to get this, and some of it, some of it's a wrestler they deal with, but... Shoot. Like you need to have a little bit more of a, a little bit more of a build up. And I told Tensai we had sort of got a disagreement about that. He wants to see him beat the crap out of a jobber or do a month of work jobber. And I'm like, well, he's like, you know what? The team that did that was the attention and nobody cared and it didn't really it didn't build up with anything other than assholes in the respect tradition under Mike. And I think that's a good comparison that you make with uh, the ascension to Baron Corbin because that that feels like the direction they're going with him, where they're just kind of throwing him to the wolves with no kind of direction or guidance that they're giving him. Just here you go, throw him right into the ocean. Good luck, try swimming. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not a I'm not a big fan of that. I mean, I get that he's sort of a pretty good badass in uh, in NXT, but I think that uh, I think that on the main roster, I mean, he needs. Number one, he needs some more space to operate. But number two, he needs better, better feuds put together. And if they, if they were feud, it could be a better feud. But I feel like he's just rushed to make this happen at uh, um, at the pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. Anyway, next match, we had Sammy Zayn. And again, this is, goes back to our theme of the League of Nations. 
this vein and lack of respect. But we have Sami Zayn wrestling Rusev, who also wrestled with the lovely Lana today. This was an interesting, uh, interesting matchup. I don't think anybody in the building expected Rusev to lose. Or I'm sorry, expected Rusev to win, which I have an issue with considering the fact that probably less than a year ago, I think he was still undefeated and one of the biggest, baddest, awesome skills WWE had to offer. And yeah, they, there's thoughts, another guy that they've been misusing in, in Rusev where, yeah, he did have the undefeated streak. And now, as you said, you didn't expect him to win. And it's gotten to the point where you don't expect him to win. And he's saddled with this League of Nations gimmick that sucks. And I remember my first comment, um, my first thought about this match and the finish to the match where Rusev gets beat with a schoolboy. I'm like, it's fitting that a wrestler who has become so boring like Rusev gets beat by a boring move like a schoolboy. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know what? I- I couldn't agree more with that. I think that, uh, and again, I, I don't know if this is just, this is sort of the hard and fast breakup of this team and what's going to actually happen to it. But I mean, Rusev, he just didn't look good in the ring. And I don't know. I, think, I mean, part of it might have just been he, I don't, he didn't have like a pony there like he usually does. But part of it is, I mean, it's so, it's so stale. And it was almost at the point where tonight made the League of Nations the social media outcast with more past history and talent. Exactly. It's, it's the same situation where you're throwing guys who couldn't get over on their own together, and that just collectively makes them even less over. Yeah, and you know what? I don't think I don't think that's necessarily the case, though. I mean, Sheamus, Sheamus always did okay. I mean, without a title on him, it was never it was never spectacular. Um, Del Rio, he always got over as a heel when he was wrestling. Team like. He can get over, but yeah, when they and, saddled him with uh, Zeb Coulter and that Mex America gimmick, that was just kind of like, oh, that just kind of like killed any momentum he had coming back into the company. Yeah, and, and the worst part about that was that Ziggler, or not Ziggler, uh, Del Rio came back. I mean, I remember commenting when he first came back a couple months ago, I'm like, holy shit, he's lost probably 20, 30 pounds. He's in the best shape he's ever been in. Because Del Rio always used to, always used to sort of be a little bit more chunky. I mean, he met his, I think it was his, uh, eating the crap out of an American suspension on Raw. He was, uh, he's pretty jacked. Yeah, I mean, he had been working down in AAA and with Lucha Underground, and yeah, he, you know, definitely got fitter, and, you know, there's no ring rust because he was, you know, wrestling in Mexico and in, the U.S. and he came back and he was in phenomenal shape and they saddled him with with such just a stupid gimmick that was doomed to fail from the start. You know what? I don't I don't necessarily think that's the case, but I think that they waited. I mean, I think they waited too long to put them because having it stable works more if you're going to be. And they did this a couple of times, but like a tag team or have three wrestlers come out of the ring all the time. That's what is stable. Is good for. Whereas this was basically all these guys just rushing around, coming out alone, and that was sort of what the uh, what everything came to there. Now mm-hmm. the next match we had, well, actually after that match we had Kevin Owens of course attaching Sami Zayn. Cause I don't think there's any League of Nation members for Kevin Owens to beat up. So basically he beat the crap out of uh, Sami Zayn to build up the um, pay per view coming up. He did, and I just, I just, Owens has to be my favorite heel in WWE at the moment, and pretty much the only heel that gets over. I mean, Owens is over like crazy with the smart marks, and they're going to cheer him anyway, but Owens is so good at being a heel, when he comes out after the match to attack Sami Zayn, just on instinct, the fans start booing him before they're like, oh wait, we like this guy, we should cheer him, but it's like he's so good as a heel, he can get that instant reaction that you're going to boo him because he goes out there and does something dastardly, and he plays that role so well. Yeah, I mean, you know what? I even go, I didn't compare him to uh, to Seth Rollins six months ago. I mean, Seth Rollins, and I know I discussed his role playing as a as a heel. I mean, he was he was literally hated by everybody. He was hated by the authority. He was hated by Randy Orton, whether or not he was in the authority. He was hated by every single face. He was hated by pretty much everybody, and. I mean, that, that's the good kind of heat, and that's the reason that he deserved WWE Championship. That's why I'm glad Owens is in the company and healthy right now, because, you know, with uh, Seth Rollins out, you really need that kind of presence, and Owens has been, you know, bearing that flag with the absence of, of Rollins. Yeah, however, 
I'd like to see him feature a little bit more, maybe on the beginning of Raw. Maybe in a championship match or championship series with Sami Zayn at some point in the future. Um, so anyway, then we have, after that attack, we have Holly Cruz and Stardust. Um, this was not a great match. Talked about Dusty Rhodes. Apparently Stardust was his, or I'm sorry, uh, Apollo Cruz was his protege, so he claims. Um, they tell some stories, talk about some stuff, and um, get on the road. Um, I don't know. It, it, this match, I, I get that Cody Rhodes isn't a championship contender. It's Rhodes turned into a jobber. Which is really I mean, sad. I remember yeah, somebody I mean, saying, does, does Stardust match. deserve better than this? And I said, Stardust does not deserve better than this, but Cody Rhodes does. And my only other thoughts on yeah. this match was that Cody came down wearing these purple LOD looking spike shoulder pads that look like he was wearing them backwards. And then he gets into the ring and Apollo Crews just murders him. Plain and simple. Yeah. And yeah, I wish the Stardust gimmick would end because I don't like Stardust. I like the character of Cody Rhodes. I mean, they could do so much with, with Cody Rhodes that they can't do with Stardust. It's like Stardust is very one dimensional and that train has long since left the station. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so anyway, after that uh, monstrosity of a match, we have Ambrose Jericho come out and see the Ambrose Asylum. This was probably the second best front mid-show promo that we've had um, this past week. And this was uh, pretty entertaining. It's both been uh, pretty good on the mic. Talk about uh, going at it at the pay-per-view. And I think this could be the surprise uh, showstopper here. I would have liked to have seen it maybe include ladders or something. But I think this is going to be a, uh, a great match. I like the speed. I especially like the way the two work on the mic where Jericho comes out there and says all the heel stuff and it just does not phase Ambrose and least Ambrose just kind of shrugs it off and then just slings the mud right back at Jericho as if he were a heel. But I mean, this is kind of the opposite of, of Owens. This is where like Ambrose can be kind of that lunatic fringe that's always going to get cheered just because he is such a loose cannon. The only thing I didn't like about this segment was where Jericho put uh, Ambrose in the walls of Jericho on a table, and I'm scratching my head thinking, are submission holds supposed to hurt more if you apply them on a table? I mean, I can see if you powerbomb somebody through a table, how that would supposedly hurt more than getting powerbombed in a ring, but a submission hold on a table? Eh, yeah, didn't do it yeah, for me. Yeah, it was... Uh... And I can't imagine, if anything, I'm not imagining it being less or more, I mean, just more, more, more convenient. It, like, it, it almost t- takes away the effect of it as a effective move. I mean, I get the walls of Jericho is pretty serious in the ring, but outside the ring where you have cables and you have whatever, uneasy chairs and stuff like that, like, I would feel like it'd be a lot harder to really get in there with some stability and get it to stop. Yeah, that was my only so, gripe about that was was it on a table, but everything else between those two was just gold. Yeah. This, I did like, uh, one of the things I did like was Ambrose uh, ragging on Jericho's attire. Um, I feel like him and Miz are sharing the same closet, if not in the same closet as far as their <laughs> attire. Like, lots of, yeah, lots of uh, vests, um, scarves, um, no shirt, and trying to look like WWE, almost male divas, trying to trying to look good and look super important. Yeah, I remember so, my smart ass tweet about Jericho's boots. I said, "Oh, so seven hundred fifty dollars is the going rate for elevator platform boots these days?" Is it hashtag short people yeah, problems? Mean, yeah, but you know what? I think this match is the pay per view. This one steals the show and hopefully builds up something for. Her. Yeah, that can be your that can be your surprise match, to your dark horse, your sleeper match there, Ambrose versus Jericho. Because, I mean, you know, Roman Reigns versus AJ Styles should be go should be good. Although there may be some chicanery and shenanigans and tons and tons of interference, so we don't know how that'll go. But yeah, Ambrose versus Jericho. I can't see any interferences or dusty finishes. That's just going to be one on one, and that may be your your dark horse, your sleeper, your one that you're not expecting to steal steal the show that does. Yeah, so this should be uh this should be an interesting match. And then we have oh god, we have Natalia and Charlotte which was uh or I'm sorry, it was Natalia and um what the heck's her name? Emma. 
the uh, now bad Emma, who has a remix of her music in a bad attitude. Anyway, of course, leading into the pick for you, we have Natalia pick up the win. And I don't know if this has been teased in the past or it was just announced, but Natalia's, I guess, his father, Red Hart, uncle. will be out there, uncle, to show his support during the big, um, during the big WWE Women's Championship match at Payback versus Charlotte. So yeah, they had have, mentioned it um, uh, a few weeks ago. I, I, you know, I missed that, and I don't think Bret Hart's been out there since. I read about it on the internet, and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. It's like, I didn't think they had enough hype on And, yeah, Hart made some WWE. comments on the internet saying he's not really looking forward to it, but, you know, he's kind of doing it out of family obligation. It was like, whoa. <laughs> it's like, yeah, just tell us how you really feel, Brett. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. This would be interesting. I, I think this match is probably a t- toss-up. I think that Charlotte, Charlotte will somehow win it. But, uh, you know what? Maybe, maybe uh, this is good because Bret Hart beats the crap out of, uh, um, what's his name? Out of uh, Ric Flair. Ric Flair. And basically ends the entertainment. Uh, be the equalizer. Is. And, yeah, let, let Charlotte get over on her own as a heel. Let her develop her own t- heel tactics aside from having Daddy at ringside. Because having Daddy at ringside does not make you a good heel. Yeah, it is major hot though because she's freaking hot. I love Charlotte. She's 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 a good wrestler too, and it's like you know I think if she would you know go to some kind of heel tactic like using a foreign object that she would conceal, you know that would be good old school heel heat. You know something like that where she doesn't have to rely on anybody but herself. You know get over on your your yeah. heel mentality, your heel smarts, your heel brain. Yeah, so who knows? Maybe uh maybe this match with the uh, dog owners pushes or something to get this resolved. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the match, the pay-per-view, the Emma versus Natalia match. The only good thing I have to say about this is at the time this was on, on Monday night, um, a live stream of CMLL came on YouTube and that was when I had them both go on at the same time. And I was like, Ooh, CMLL is more interesting. So yay for Mexican wrestling. Very nice. Very nice. Um, all right. So, what else we have? We have a touching tribute to uh, China, who passed away. Um, I do not know. Um, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this before, but um, myself and China, we were actually, uh, um, we actually filmed a, or attempted to film a uh, movie together um, a couple of years back. Were you, were you aware of this, Killer Calf? No, I was not. Which movie was this? Um, it, it was actually it was it was going by the working title of Five Seconds in China, <laughs> and unfortunately, after about eighteen takes and a week attempts, we can, we cannot come up with five seconds of footage of me inside China. It was uh, it it, 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 it was a little uh, a little premature there, but um, anyway, we tried to. Basically, we were trying to make it a mine of my sexual exploits, and unfortunately, uh, we, we cannot come up with enough footage for the five seconds of a vine to put it out there and hopefully go viral. So, um, unfortunately for myself, I never got my big, my big porno break as I had hoped for it through China. But in reality, um, she passed away, probably drug overdose. Not a huge surprise because she's been a mess over the years, but still stinks. And she'll probably get inducted to the WWE Hall of Fame next year because Triple H and I think everybody backstage with WWE, at least the executives, had a bit of a gripe with her. So, bummer is the happen, but I mean, it is what it is. When you turn into a train wreck like that, it does not usually end well. And I'm glad they did a segment yeah. on Raw about it. I wish they would have, they had like a five second thing to open the show with, just kind of like a moment of silence, but it would have been nice if they had put that, you know, right after the moment of silence, the package to China. It was weird that it came this late into the show. That's my only complaint with it. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? I mean, I think a lot of it is, I mean, there's, there's a major heat between WWE and her. I mean, which is why she's not in the Hall of Fame. Um, why, um, her and, Triple H aren't friends anymore. Why Stephanie doesn't really have much respect for her and why she's sort of been ostracized from the WWE alumni roster, I guess you call it. 
But it was good that they well, did yeah. a video package and they didn't just completely kayfabe and blow off the fact that she had passed away. So you did the yeah. right thing there, um, WWE. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, you know what? They're as right as they could do with this scenario. Um, she did see another wrestler die young, but at the same time, I mean, she got in. I think yeah, when she got out, she had a lot of unresolved issues and she just decided I'm just going to take, take a lot of drugs to handle it. Um, anyway, next match, um, this wasn't going to really get started, but it was Baron Corbin versus Damian Sandow. I actually, I absolutely hated it, seeing Sandow in the ring. Um, I'm a huge fan of Sandow. Um, and I think that even at the pay-per-view at WrestleMania, I mean, he got a huge pop from the crowd, I think, going into the Battle Royal, the Andre Giant Battle Royal. So, just sad to see him, uh, relegated to in the ring at this time. Um, they didn't even get started in the ring together, and Ziggler. Ziggler um, comes out, yeah. Corbin yeah, I'm not I'm a fan of Sandow, but at the same time, part of me was like, thank you, Ziggler, for saving me from having to watch a match with Baron Corbin in it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'd rather see Damian Sandow yeah, face somebody you know what? good I mind, I mind Baron Corbin. I would have minded Baron Corbin in the match, or his strikes. I think Ziggler and him could have been a great match. But when you have him standing in the ring at this time, you know it's going to be a two-minute match. And it's not going to it's not gonna get the attention to serve. I mean, I feel like with the right booking, you can probably have a solid matchup. And, I mean, maybe you could just put Ziggler, um, Sandow, and um, what's his name? And, uh, what the hell? Corbin? Yeah, and Corbin in the same ring. Maybe that's what you need to do. But, I mean, I feel bad for Sandow because he, I mean, he's great, 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 great worker. And the fans love him. Yeah, he's another one like Neville that's a great worker, but they just never feature him. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he got probably the biggest ovation of the uh, of the evening at the uh, WWE, not the uh, um, not the Royal Rumble, or not the um, Battle Royal. Well, actually, no, I think it was the Battle Royal. He got a pretty good, uh, got a pretty good pop there. Yeah, he's he's a fan favorite yeah. too, and it's just kind of a head scratcher why WWE isn't utilizing him more. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know who's pure as he pissed him, but uh, he definitely rubbed somebody the wrong way. They get relegated to, uh, to scrub status there. Uh, let's see here. Oh, God, we have the Miz and Cesaro match. I love the fact that Cesaro's getting a push here. I don't know if Miz is the right person to do it against, but hopefully Miz can get the title and have a prosperous title reign here because... He is much more impressive than um, uh, he's much more impressive than the Miz. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those things where I was watching it. And my first thought when I'm watching any Miz matches, I'm like, my God, I wish the Miz would go to TNA so that nobody anywhere ever would have to watch the Miz. They've tried title run after title run with the Miz. It doesn't work out. He doesn't get over as a face. He doesn't get over as a heel. And when Cesaro laid him out, I was like, way to go, Cesaro. I hope you legit injure Miz. I don't want to see him on my TV anymore. Yeah, I want to see. I'd rather see Sandow wrestle than the Miz. I mean, oh, well, one hundred percent, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he just doesn't, he, he just doesn't get a pop, and he doesn't get, he doesn't even get go away. He just doesn't get a reaction, which is, uh, which is sort of weird. I mean, he, he'll get, he'll definitely get booed after talking a little bit because he's good. He's pretty good at getting the heel rub from the crowd. But yeah, I mean, as far as, uh, as far as just having people genuinely that hate him, they don't. And the same thing with love him, they don't. So, it's just kind of like we want you to know. go away. We just we don't want you on our TV. We don't hate you. We just don't want you here. Yeah, we're not we're not invested enough to boo you like we boo Xbox, but we're not gonna we're not gonna ha- we're just not gonna have a reaction. We're gonna sit on our hands for this entire uh, this entire segment here. So anyway, that was a uh, that was pretty quick little segment. Cesaro did his Grammy belt standing above him. I think Cesaro takes the title. I hope Cesaro takes the title because Miz isn't doing much with it right at this moment. I concur. All right. Um, then we have, going into the main event, we have Roman Reigns 
RK Pack, um, WWE Champion versus AJ Styles, or Payback Challenger for WWE Championship. Um, and this was actually the finale, and probably, probably the best worker out of the uh, League of Nations, you have Alberto Del Rio, or Del Rio. However, um, with everything that's gone on, I think it was a foregone conclusion that Del Rio was going to lose and that there was going to be some outside interference. You want to explain what uh, happened during this match? Sure. And yeah. I mean, I, I'll further what you said. This is where you said, you know, it's, it's just obvious that Alberto Del Rio is going to lose because Roman Reigns is their chosen Superman. At this point, Barbaro Cavernario was on the CMLL show on YouTube and it's telling when I'm more interested in a caveman gimmick guy in a Mexican promotion than I am in the main event on Raw. But yeah, what happens is the Bullet Club uh, came out to lay a beating on Reigns, and AJ Styles stops them. He wants to beat Roman Reigns on his own, but since AJ was such a fucking asshole to his friends there, Roman Reigns gets up, and for good measure, just boom, takes him out, and then takes out the brothers, uh, Anderson and Gallows, too. But uh, AJ manages to get up and hit a forearm shot to Reigns, and then they're both kind of just laying there. So it's kind of like, eh. I mean, it was good to see that you know, Roman Reigns didn't walk away unscathed and that he kind of got his comeuppance and that, you know, AJ got beat on and that Anderson and Gallows got beat on. So it wasn't a total squash one way or the other. And from that aspect, I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I, I agree with that. I'd agree with that. It actually built up the feud of, Hey, you know what? You guys hate each other for a reason. It's like I was thinking, I'm like, oh, my God, they're going to have Roman Reigns squash all three of them. They're going to have him squash AJ. They're going to have him squash Anderson. They're going to have him squash Gallows. But, yeah, when AJ got up and made his counterattack, you know, it was nice that he didn't no-sell it completely and just keep beating on Reigns. It was nice that he just kind of hit that one counterattack, and then everybody was just laid out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's – I don't know. I I mean, I think you needed to do something here. And this is good. I think the drama in this match isn't whether Reigns wins or loses. I think, unfortunately, I think the better award Reigns keeps the title here. But it's going to be a matter of how how it goes down. Is Bullet Club going to turn their back on him? Or are they going to get AJ Styles disqualified? What's going? Are they going to interfere and AJ Styles get pissed off and rolled up or something? There's, uh, I'm, I'll be interested to see how this one. There's a lot of different solutions. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the bigger storyline, yeah, the bigger interest isn't, you know, if Reigns retains the title or loses the title. It's more, you know, what is the relationship between the Balor Club and AJ Styles? Yeah, or better yet, how it goes down. I mean, Finn Balor could come out during his match and interfere in some way, shape, or form. And we're, we're all expecting at least Anderson and Gallows to intervene at least on the part of AJ or to hinder AJ from winning the title. Now, I could even see them coming in to interfere, you know, on behalf of AJ, but then Roman Reigns ducks and they happen to hit AJ with a chair or something. I could totally see a spot like that happening in the match too. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm not a big fan of, uh, I'm not a big fan of this matchup. I'm a big fan of all the potential results and how you get there. So, should be a uh, should be interesting pay per view. Any uh any picks for the pay per view that you want? Yeah, let's run down the card. About or have... Yeah, um, yeah, I, I I see Roman Reigns retaining the title. Um, we talked about that one. Cesaro, I'd like to see Cesaro beat the Miz because yeah, Miz has no business holding a title. Um, I'd like to see Jericho give the rub to Ambrose and have Ambrose go over since at the last big show Chris Jericho went over AJ Styles. I think it's time for Jericho to put over. Ambrose, I'd like to see that. Um, and honestly, I'd like to see Kevin Owens squash Sami Zayn so that feud will continue so that Zayn will have to come back with fire and you know fight harder against Kevin Owens, and we'll get to see more of that because those two are phenomenal in the ring. I see Charlotte retaining the title. I don't see Natalia being the one to take it off her. I think uh, whoever's going to unseat Charlotte will either be Sasha Banks or Bailey when they bring Bailey up for that ultimate heel versus ultimate face matchup, but it's not going to be Natalia winning the title, and like I said earlier, I think uh, the VOD villains are going to win the tag team match. And I don't care about Ziggler yeah. and Corbin or Kalisto and Ryback. Yeah, yeah, I think in that, uh, we have Corbin win there, I think that, and I think that they, uh, I really don't give a crap about Kalisto. Uh, I don't know, maybe they set up his next opponent. opponent. 
I like your tag team matches. Um, I would not be surprised at all. I, in fact, I'd be surprised if it didn't happen if you had, um, if you end up having the Usos versus um, um, Anderson and Gallows. If that gets added before Sunday, if that gets if that gets announced on SmackDown or something tomorrow. Yeah, night. yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's about it. I think that's uh, everything that's one uh, wanted to cover. Appreciate you uh, stepping up, stepping in, and uh, and taking care of this monstrosity. But uh, hopefully, uh, the week after payback is a little bit more uh, um, a little bit more exciting for Raw. And I think we made a lot of good progress after Raw this year, despite what ratings would say. And I, hopefully, that continues uh, moving forward. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me on the show. It was good to be uh, a guest co-host this week. And yeah, I didn't get to hear the uh, the big the big big tugboat pull out of the station. Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, really appreciated that you could uh, step in here on short notice and uh, and do Angry Tens I proud. He's a very proud uh, provider, and he's I'm sure he's going to be listening tomorrow when he wakes up from his very long nap right now. And he'll be thrilled to hear that we uh we handled it and rocked it out. But uh yeah, cool. I appreciate uh appreciate you helping me out. Good uh good working with you and we'll have to do it again. Definitely, yeah. I like listening to your guys' show. So yeah, check out Raw Reaction on Mondays and you can check me out on the uh Thursday night AMP podcast on Thursdays. Sounds good. Thursday night AMP. That's uh I'll have to put on my uh put on my calendar. Kill a Kev. Could you do us the honor? Interview music brother.